Hello, my name is Steve Pepper, or Tapsa Pipuri, and this talk is an introduction to the World Loanword Database, WALD. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of the Copious 2021 Winter School of finno ugric Studies for inviting me to give this talk. You might be forgiven if you look closely at the, uh, the WALD banner for thinking that I'm one of the original developers um, but in fact, I'm not. Uh, I'm just a user um, and uh, I actually used the database for quite a different purpose than what it was originally intended for. So one of the take home messages of this talk will be to look at online databases with fresh eyes and be on the lookout for novel uses for the data. So the structure of this talk is that there will be a brief overview of WALD followed by a demo. And then I will describe a practical task uh, for those of you who want to get your hands dirty with the actual data. The origins of WALD go back to the loanword typology project, which was uh, run by the um, Department of Linguistics at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig between 2004, 2008. And the results were published uh, by de Gruyter in a, one of their handbooks called Loan Words in the World's Languages. The book consists of three introductory chapters, followed by individual chapters on 41 different languages. Now, WALD is a CLLD application. CLLD stands for Cross Linguistic Linked Data. And this is a, a, a Max Planck supported project that develops and curates interoperable data publication structures for linguistics and it uses linked data principles as an integration mechanism for open distributed resources. Currently as of the middle of January 2021 uh, the website for CLLD lists 18 applications which have a common underlying data format the CLDF and a uniform user interface. So some of these applications you will be familiar with, I'm sure. Walls is a very well known, uh, uh, perhaps the most well known of them, the World Atlas of Language Structures. I'm talking about the World Loanword Database. And if you look down the list, you'll see certain others like Blotterlog, which I hope all of you use on a daily basis. Uh, and Dictionaria, which I encourage you to look at if you're interested in uh, documenting um, um, lesser studied languages. So these are the 18 applications. WALD is one of them. And um, the first thing I want to say about WALD um, is to reveal a closely guarded secret, which is that the World Loan Word Database is not a loan word database. So what is it really? Well, the contents are not loan words. The primary contents are translation equivalents, which in the terminology of WALD, we call words, even though some of them may consist of several words. So translation equivalents of 1,460 concepts, which WALD calls meanings, in 41 languages, which are called vocabularies. Um, and of these 55,000 or so translation equivalents in the database, some 14,700 are um, classified as possibly, probably, or clearly borrowed. So that's about 25%, 26% of the database. The rest of the content, contents are not loan words. Um, the 41 languages uh, that we um, will be listing uh, shortly are recipient languages. In addition to that, there are some 350 other languages which are represented in the database, but they're only represented as donor languages, not as recipient languages. So it's a bit like a set of 41 dictionaries, except that, first of all, it's digital. Secondly, it's open source. And thirdly, it's based on a uniform set of meanings. And that's very important if you want to be able to do cross-linguistic comparison uh, of uh, any kind of semantics. In addition, each word in the database, uh, each of these 55,000 words is annotated for its loanword status. And for those words which are considered to be borrowed, you are given both the donor language and the source word 
I'll give you some examples later. In addition, and from my perspective, even more importantly, every word is annotated for analyzability. And words which are considered analyzable, a morphine gloss is provided. So uh, when we say analyzable, what we basically mean is morphosyntactically complex. So these are the 41 vocabularies, that's to say the recipient languages that are represented in the database. You'll see that uh, there is only one Uralic language among them, um, but a number of other Uralic languages, Fennic, Finno, Ugric, Hungarian, etc., are represented as donor languages, and we'll see some of those later on. Regarding this sample, move myself out of the way here. Regarding the sample, the editors write that in selecting languages for inclusion in the project, an effort was made to represent the world's genealogical, geographical, typological, and sociolinguistic diversity. However, the overriding factors were practical. No serious and timely offer to contribute a database and book chapter was turned down. Admittedly, our language sample is not ideal, but it is much better than anything that existed before our project. So this is the distribution of the, uh, the languages, uh, the recipient languages by geographical area and language family. And you can see there's quite a good spread there, but it's far from being balanced either aerially or um, genealogically. So let's talk about the 1,460 meanings around which the data are organized. They are divided into five so-called semantic word classes, uh, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and function words. And uh, I'll explain why all of those are in square, scare quotes uh, in a moment. And they also are divided into 24 semantic fields, such as the physical world, kinship, animals, etc. And these semantic fields uh, are based on the those that you find in the Intercontinental Dictionary Series, IDS, uh, about which I'll have a little bit more to say right at the end of the talk. So these semantic word classes, more precisely, we're talking about ontological categories. As the authors, uh, the editors write, the labels correspond to traditional part of speech labels, but this is purely for convenience. There's no expectation that these ontological categories would necessarily match the parts of speech in a particular language, although this is often the case. So basically, the uh, semantic word class labeled nouns consists of things and entities. Verbs consist of actions and processes, adjectives of properties, adverbs of manner and location, function words of grammatical meanings. And as we know, um, especially in the case of something like properties, these are not always represented in the language by something belonging to the word class adjective, may just as well be something belonging to the word class noun in that particular language or the word class verb. So these are ontological categories, not um, uh, grammatical categories. The 24 semantic fields are as shown here, the physical world, kinship, animals, etc., etc and the number of meanings in each of those uh, fields is uh, shown alongside. Uh, we'll look at spatial relations in a moment, which consists of 75 different meanings uh, distributed across those five semantic word classes that we just looked at. So here we have the examples under sp spatial relations uh, under the semantic word class adjective, that's to say property, you have meanings like big, crooked, deep, flat, etc. Um, nouns, the ball, the bottom, the circle, typical um, entities, and verb processes and actions to change, to cover, to divide, etc. And these are the kinds of meanings that you have um, around which the data is organized, and then for each of these you have translation equivalents in each of the 41 languages. Those translation equivalents, as I mentioned earlier, are annotated both for analyzability and for uh, loanword status. Myself over in the other corner now and see if that less in the way. So one category of an analyzability is unanalyzable. 
So that's if the form could not be analyzed into two or more constituents, and that's given a simplicity score of 1.0. The second category is semi-analyzable. Semi this is the case if a constituent structure could be identified, but not all constituents have meanings, such as a cranberry morph, or if the word was analyzable to linguists, but not to lay speakers. Words like this are given a simplicity score of 0.75. And then the last three categories are different forms of analyzable, uh, derived, compound, phrasal. One shouldn't um, put too much store by the classification, the subclassification here into uh, derived, compound, and phrasal because the, um, uh, the criteria by which um, words should be classified into these different categories are not very clear, but at least there's three analyzable types and they are all given a simplicity score of 0 0.5. We'll see what the simplicity score is used for later. So here's some examples of analyzable words from the database in uh, Kildin Sami, the one Uralic language which is re represented. And you see here we have a number of uh, different words representing meanings in the right hand column, chieftain, eyelid, breakfast. And since they're all analyzable, they are all provided with a morphine gloss, um, which you see in the middle column. Um, so uh, for example, the word for eyelid is made up of uh, two constituents uh, with the meaning eye and brim, etc. So this analyze, uh, this, uh, these morphine glosses are really quite important and, and useful. There's a lot of interesting information there, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So that's analyzability. Now, what about loanword status? Well, there are five different grades of loanword status. Zero says that there's no evidence for borrowing of a particular word. One, that there's very little evidence for borrowing. Two, maybe the word, word is borrowed. Three, it's probably borrowed. Four, it's clearly borrowed. And here's some examples, again, from uh, Kildin Sami. Um, we have words in the category five, where there's no evidence for borrowing, like for example, uh, chief, meaning clean. Um, we have category two, probably borrowed, like mitlesh, uh, which is uh, said to be borrowed from mieleva, meaning clever in Karelian, etc., etc. So for every word which is considered, for every word in the uh, Kildin Sami uh, vocabulary, uh, you have information about whether or not it is borrowed, and if so, which language it's borrowed from. Now, I want to mention briefly uh, the relationship between analyzability and borrowing, because this is key to uh, the point I want to make in the next slide, which is um, why I think uh, WALD should be regarded as something much, much more than a loan word database. And that is that what the um, editors write is that in assessing the possible loanword status of a word, the first question was whether the word was analyzable, i.e. morphosyntactically complex within the language. If this was the case, it was almost certain that it was created by speakers of the language rather than borrowed from some other language. Such words were not considered loanwords, even when they contained borrowed elements. And think about that for a moment. For the loanword project, only unanalyzable words were of interest, basically. If the word was analyzable, it was ruled out as being borrowed, or possibly being borrowed. So everything that was not unanalyzable was basically thrown away in the analysis, and none of those interesting morphological analyses were in fact used. But that stuff really is gold dust. Um, so to me, the real value of WALD is as a source of some 20,000 morphologically analyzed words in 41 languages. And that's how I used them in my PhD project on binomial lexemes. I was able to utilize WALD for a completely different purpose than what it was originally intended and for two different tasks. The first was to select a set of nominal meanings uh, that are most often expressed by complex, as to say, analyzable forms. 
and the second was to extract a starter set of analyzed data. And if you're interested in um, learning more about that, there's a reference to my um, dissertation there. So that's uh, one way in which you can use WALD. Of course, for, if you're only interested in Uralic languages, uh, WALD is not uh, that interesting for you. Um, but there is another database which I want to mention very briefly, the Intercontinental Dictionary Series, also a CLLD um, application, which has a very similar structure to WALD. It's divided into vocabularies, meanings and words. Um, there are much there are many more vocabularies in IDS than there are in WALL, 332 as opposed to the 41. There's almost the same number of meanings and they are in fact the same meanings, um, apart from a few which were added for WALL. Uh, and there's many more words. words. So instead of the 55,000 that you have in WALL, there's the 400,000. So, and here we have, um, so what, what you don't have is uh, information regarding loanword status, or information regarding analyzability. On the other hand, uh, you do have explicit links to the C Concepticon, another CLLD project, which is uh, uh, very useful. And the coverage includes 13 Uralic languages, so not just uh, um, the one Sami language that we have in WALD, but uh, a much greater variety of Uralic languages. So there's a lot of data there if you are working on Uralic languages and want to make comparisons. So that's the IDS, that's WALD. I'll give you a short demo now uh, of WALD at the interface. So look, here we go. Move myself again over in the top right corner, I guess. And um, this is the opening page. Uh, as you can see, we have vocabularies, meanings, languages. We also have uh, authors, of course, and various uh, metadata. If we start by looking at vocabularies, um, we can see the 41 languages listed here, and the authors, the number of words they contain, and the percentage of loan words. Scrolling down a little, we, um, we can find Kildin Sami. Let's have a look, where is it? Well, I'm not going to scroll, I'm just going to use this um, feature here that you have in all the CLLD applications for filtering uh, based on textual content. Here we find uh, Kildin Sami and we go to the vocabulary Kildin Sami page. So this is the page about Kildin Sami as a uh, recipient language. Uh, if it were also a donor language, there would be a separate page for Kildin Sami as a donor language, but in this case, it has apparently not uh, been a source of loan words in any of the other 40 languages. Here we have a list of the 1,467 meaning word pairs uh, in Kildin Sami. Um, there's a description of the language there and the ways in which the, um, the loan words um, have been annotated. And then if we look at the, 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 the loan word, the words themselves, we'll see that the ones which have, um, are considered to be borrowed um, are, um, have the source words provided in the far right column. So there are actually two words here, meaning the world, uh, one of which is not borrowed, the first one, the second of which is apparently borrowed. Uh, we can uh, sort these columns on, on this, this table on any of the columns up here. So word form, we can sort on word form and we get uh, all the entries alphabetically, 100 uh, entries at a time per page. Um, we see that the first one, meaning the, the rain, is probably borrowed uh, from Indo-European and some co couple of cognates are given here uh, from Avistan and, uh, and Latin. Uh, in the second row, we see that the monkey, the word for monkey, was uh, apparently borrowed from, from Russian, but its borrowed status is given as five, no evidence for borrowing, uh, and that's a bug. Um, so this is um, uh, a lesson in use of these online databases. You will find uh, errors. They're not completely error-free. But in general, um, the quality is so high that the small number of errors don't uh, affect the, uh, 
the actual results when you do statistical analyses and these kinds of things. So that is the vocabularies tab. We go to the meanings. Uh, we see that we have one tab for semantic fields and the other for all meanings. Under semantic fields, we have the 24 fields, any of which we can click on, such as, for example, the body. And that lists all the meanings which are part of the semantic field, the body, so the body itself, skin or hide, flesh, hair, etc., etc. Each of these can be, um, again, we can, we can um, order the contents uh, of these tables. So, for example, let's, um, well, let's restrict ourselves, first of all, to nouns. That's to say the uh, semantic word class noun, so objects and uh, entities. Uh, and we can uh, see uh, order by borrowed score. Uh, those which have the lowest borrowed score are words like nose, itch, eyelid, etc. So um, these are words which we know are um, very rarely borrowed. On the other hand, if we sort the other way, we can see that um, meanings such as physician, poison, medicine are very often borrowed, um, at least on the basis of this set of data from 41 languages. We can also look at the simplicity score, ordered by that. Let's have the, uh, the highest, uh, from highest to lowest. So the highest simplicity score is for words, again, like flesh, blood, hand, horn. These are words which are typically not analyzable. Um, on the other hand, we sort in the other order, we see that words like nostril, earlobe, eyelid, earwax, uh, meanings, or words with those meanings are, uh, are, are very often um, represented by analyzable morphologically complex words. So that's a brief uh, overview of the interface here. Um, the student task will be to um, start out by, by looking at, uh, at this interface in a little bit more depth, but The student task involves more than that. Now, what I want to say is that all of these CLLD databases are interesting and fun to play with. And sometimes the interface gives you easy access to exactly the information you require. But to do really powerful stuff, you need to work directly with the underlying data. So this task gives students the opportunity to do exactly that. It's not for the faint hearted, but it will reward your effort. Uh, a little familiarity with databases will help, but a willingness to gain such familiarity is more important. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know PostgreSQL, which is involved in the task, but you might find it helpful to know someone who does. So very briefly, what the task uh, asks you to do is first explore the, um, the online interface, which I've been showing you just now look at it in a little bit more depth and especially look under the, the tab languages, which I didn't show you. But then it asks you to download the data uh, itself, the underlying data, which is in the form of a PostgreSQL uh, dump um, in a file called wall.sql.gz. Uh, then to install um, PostgreSQL itself, and to load the data into the database. It then asks you to run an SQL query, which you, uh, which you can take from my dissertation. It shows you how to modify that query. And then it takes you to uh, further on to exploring the data using another SQL query, which you can get from my dissertation. So the hope is that through going through these exercises, you will actually get a feeling for what it means to get your hands on the data itself and play with it using a database system. Like I said, it might be challenging, but I hope you're all up for a challenge. Uh, if you're interested in online databases, this is really the only way to, uh, to learn how to use them. So, and with that, I wish you the best of luck. My email address is on the first slide. Email me if you have any trouble at all, if you have any questions. I'm not uh, an expert on PostgreSQL or the inner workings of WALD, so I might not be able to answer any, any all of them. 
but uh, I'll do my best and uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Right, I will try to stop the meeting.